All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about insect behavior and animal behavior um, as a way of kind of helping explain it. Um, obviously, animals, we see behavior in animals as most clear in animals, meaning that you can see a response of some sort to some type of stimuli that happens kind of in real time. There is um, arguably behaviors that you can see in plants and other organisms as well. It's not as clear cut in something like a plant because their behaviors can take uh, time and it may not be something that happens necessarily from what we call the brain. So we tend to be very, um, you know, egocentric when it comes to brains and animals and the size of the brains. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some type of behaviors that we can see in simple animals or single cell organisms as well. But generally speaking, an animal behaviorist looks at the behavior of animals as being a lot more complex. So when we talk about behaviors, some of these behaviors appear to be related to their genetics. In other words, you can see how we can find genes that actually seem to be responsible for certain behaviors. Now, why is that? Well, remember the genes make our blueprints for making proteins and those proteins and the structure that is formed as a whole um, provides the basic machinery that will cause that behavior to exist. So, that, so, pe so people have been able to find a gene that seems to be responsible for um, caregiving, like in mice, for instance. They found a gene that seems to be strongly correlated or responsible for good mothering in mice. So we know that there's genes that are responsible for certain behaviors. And when it comes from within the animal, we tend to call it innate. Innate might be another term that you could say is analogous to instinct. So when we see instinctive behaviors, we call them innate. And they typically are stereotypical behaviors, meaning that they'll, they'll do the same kind of behavior over and over again. One of the most classical examples of this is in geese. You'll see egg rolling behavior. So let's imagine you saw a goose and it's laying and you laid, she's laid some eggs. Well, if she saw the egg outside of her nest, she would actually start rolling the egg back into her nest in a very stereotypical manner to the point where you could even remove the egg from under her beak and yet she would still do the behavior all the way back to her nest. The round shape being outside of her nest actually is in neat and will actually stimulate that behavior. So she didn't have to actually learn it. Now learning is more of an adaptation to the environment. So going back to, now talking about insects a little bit, you know, it is innate for a bee to look for flowers and get nectar. But you can actually train a bee, teach the bee, um, certain flowers would have a different type of food source. So they can make an artificial flower, put certain colors on it, and train the bee to go find those particular colors because there's a high reward. So again, learning can also be, um, is involved in this, but it's, remember there's an interplay between instinct and learning. So learning tends to have an innate aspect, like the bee learning to identify artificial flowers with certain honey types or with a big reward. That is instinctive to find the flowers, but it's even, but it's still kind of a learning thing that's kind of geared towards learning. So some learning is very instinctive in how it comes about and when it happens. Now, simple responses are called reflexes. So again, thinking about from a human perspective, you know, you could have a little 
hammer hits you in the knee and you have a reflex. Well, insects obviously have simple reflexes too. Like if you try to swat at a fly, um, they can pick up on the movement and be, the reflex will be to move rapidly. And so that would be an example of a simple reflex where if you touch it on the wing or hit the right hair, it'll respond as a reflex. Those aren't necessarily complex behaviors, they're very simple. Now what's helping influence these behaviors is the giant axons. Remember the, when you dissect, open a caterpillar and look inside it, or you've seen from the pictures, there's these axons that go down the ventral side, the big ganglions, and um, they're very rapid in providing a direct signal to the muscles to respond. Remember the axons are the portion of the nerves that send the signal to the muscles. Now, some of these reflexes include taxis. Taxis means movement toward or away from a stimuli. So light can be a taxis for some animals. Or it actually may, they may move from a bright light source. So, or maybe there's a certain smell in the air that attracts um, ants to find a food source. That's an example of taxis. So those are types of movements away from or towards a stimuli. So there's all sorts of different types of taxes. Um, here's just some things like thermotaxes, as you can imagine, is related to temperature, or chemotaxes related to smells. Um, astrotaxes would be related to obviously picking up on maybe starlight kind of thing. So there's all sorts of different types of taxes, phototaxes. Uh, for seeing, phototaxis for sound, geotaxis. There's just a variety of different things that insects will move towards or away from. Insects are also capable of communication, particularly in social insects like ants and bees. There's things like waggle dances where a bee can teach or tell other bees where to go and where a food source is. So they can literally walk, and I'll show you a video of this, but they can actually do a figure eight dance in their beehive after they return. And the number of waggles they do tells the bees in the nest how far away it is. So complex communication can occur in insects as well. And they can also communicate I mean, that's a visual cue as well as sound, but they can also um, do it through light. For instance, fireflies will have a certain sequence of light when they're blue by malumescence that will attract mates. And so there's different species of fireflies in the family Lampyridae. Lampyridae. And <clears throat> they will attract their species based on having the same light sequence. Now, ironically, there are some fireflies that actually have become predators and will actually fool other fireflies by blinking in a way that mimics um, the mating response of that other species of firefly. So this predator firefly will blink the same light sequence that will attract this other species of firefly who th male that, that thinks he's going to get it on with a female. And when he lands, he ends up getting eaten. So they can use it as a trick as well. But typically speaking, fireflies will blink the right sequence that will attract uh, mates to each other. And that'll be based on species. That would be an innate response, but it's also can, um, as a form of communication. And so here you can see the predatory firefly eating the smaller firefly by tricking it into the way it blinks its light towards it. They can also communicate through sound. Striations or stridulation in orthoptera. Does everybody remember what an orthoptera is now? What order, 
What kind of insects are found in the order Orthoptera? Is that the grasshoppers and crickets? Yeah. And what about Hemiptera? Those are the tree bugs, I think. Yep. And they have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, so good. And so they can include stink bugs and things like that. Well, they can make sounds that help them in mate location. So when you hear the crickets making, you know, and then they drive you crazy if they get in your house, that helps them to find each other. Um, even wing beats, I believe, can affect mosquitoes finding each other. They can also be a warning sign because you know if you ever walk around and, and all of a sudden the crickets stop, you know, there's usually a sign that there's a predator lurking around. Um, here it looks like an antenna, so it means that probably chemical communication is next. So this antenna is full of fuzzy um, side branches that are used for picking up on pheromones. Pheromones are chemicals that come from one insect or one organism to another, causing a response in the other one. So it's kind of like a hormone that is floating in the air and then causes another organism to respond to it. And so insects like male moths can pick up on the female form of pheromones and then find her in the middle of the forest and mate with her and then of course, they'll lay a bunch of eggs or she'll lay a bunch of eggs, but it's the um, male's bushy um, antenna that helps him to pick up on that pheromone and then fly to her. Now, <clears throat> some of these chemicals are beneficial and some are not, depending on the species. And so, but again, that provides a information to each other. And that's what we're talking about by chemicals. So cinnamons would be an example of the pheromone that's released by the male or the female moth that attracts the male moth. They're both benefiting by reproducing and having more offspring. Alimones are a benefit to the sender. And maybe we'll see if we can find out an example of this. And caramones are benefits for the receiver. And so the receiver would be like maybe a predator can pick up on a smell of a prey item. And so the predator or parasitoid wasp can smell the um, maybe the the caterpillar or whatever it wants to eat on. And so that is a chemical communication to the predator. But it's certainly not a benefit to the caterpillar that's about to get eaten that, that, that provided that chemical cue. It's not something it wanted to do, but it ended up becoming a detriment to the caterpillar that the predator could find it. So that's an example of a caramel. And then the alimone is a benefit to the sender. So in other words, maybe it's a chemical that can cause others to leave the area. So let's say that a caterpillar, or excuse me, a moth has laid eggs on a leaf. She might have a chemical signature that is being released to tell other mothers to go away so that her offspring can feed on that plant. So it would benefit the sender, but it doesn't help the other moths who now fly off to find another food source. Now, semi-chemicals like pheromones are intraspecific. That means they're within species. And again, they can often be sex pheromones that causes a male moth to find the female moth or they could be an aggregation pheromone, like in some species, they can attract others of their kind to come and help feed on a tree. Or they could be an alarm pheromone where the insect or whatever is harmed and then releases a signal that tells all the other insects to run away or fly away or whatever. That's an example of alarm pheromone. 
So bark beetles actually um, attack conifers. And what happens is they'll usually attack the tree. The tree will do some, mount some type of defense against it. But they can send out an aggregation pheromone that attracts more and more of their species to attack that tree and obviously be harmful to the tree. That would be an example of an aggregation pheromone when they're attracting other bark beetles to come to your tree. And then anti-aggregation is in the case of like what I was ex explaining with the moth who may use an egg that when it lays its eggs, tells other moths to stay away from that tree. So here's our Southern pine beetle. And it is devastating to pine trees and causes all sorts of galleries by feeding underneath the bark and doing so, in some cases, when there's enough of them, they will actually kill the tree. Here's an example of the different um, highways and galleries that they've eaten through the tree. And we can watch a little video on this too. And so all these pine trees have been destroyed by bark beetles. And then this can get bigger and bigger if there's, because a lot of times these trees have a hard time mounting a plant defense against them. What about red imported fire ants? Solenoptus invictae, Victa. Well, they can use aggregation pheromones. So when one bites you, or they send out a pheromone, they can cause a bunch of other ones to come and attack you as well. So that would be kind of an aggregation slash alarm pheromone. So here's an anthill of fire ants. And usually, again, a lot of them don't get that far north because of our harsher winters. So you'll find them in Texas and any kind of warm state where the winter isn't too harsh. So I think they made it up to as far as southern Arkansas, but they might end up even further now. There's a certain march and then, um, but what happens is if you disturb one of these, you're going to have an aggregation slash alarm pheromone that causes, you know, you attack, you accidentally attack one of them, then you got thousands on you. And they can leave pretty severe welts on your skin. Look how damaging that is. And painful. So let's talk about insect reproduction and development. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier about the different types of um, reproductive systems. As you know, most insects reproduce sexually and most are oviparous, parous, which means that they lay eggs. But that's not true for all insects. Some insects are actually asexual like aphids where they can, or, or they have live births. And so, Anyhow, um, we've already talked about how the male testes produce sperm and the female ovaries produce eggs, and that eggs and sperm are haploid. Hopefully you remember this from another biology class, but basically that means half of their chromosomes come from the mother and half come from the father, just like we have. And when you join the haploid egg, the haploid sperm, you have a diploid organism. But some of the organisms can actually, like in bees, can actually be haploid as adults, like uh, the males, I believe. So not all the rules exist exactly like you would expect. Here's a bunch of eggs that have been glued together. Here's mating taking place um, with um, damselflies that are closely related to dragonflies. Damselflies, the wings actually fold across their back. We know they're mating because of the way that um, what's happening here. Um, the, I was getting a little confused, but I believe this, is, this would be the female. 
clasping onto the male, and then the male is providing sperm to the female. Yeah, that's the way it should be. I believe that's what's happening here. So I need to double check that. <clears throat> anyway, courtship behaviors have been found in over one third of the studied insect species. So they're not necessarily widespread, but one third is still a lot of insects. As I mentioned before, when the sperm and the egg come together, they form a diploid zygote. A zygote means a fertilized egg, and diploid means the two sets of chromosomes. There's also a thing, phenomenon called sperm competition that exists not only in insects, but exists in us as well. And the idea is that there is a selection going on, like natural selection going on in sperm, where <clears throat> you know, the individuals with healthier sperm, for instance, can reproduce at a higher rate. And all sorts of different things come out of this, what they call sperm competition, because basically it's two males and their sperm are competing to fertilize that egg. And so some, there's all sorts of weird things that come out of sperm competition. Um, mate guarding is an example where a male will guard a female after mating with her to increase the likelihood that his sperm fertilizes the egg versus another male coming along and fertilizing the female. That's one example. They also make sperm plugs that prevent another male from being able to have sex with the female, that's a sperm plug. And we see even sperm competition in primates, for instance. Um, chimpanzees are known for having huge testicles and a very flexible sexual life. So they're all kind of getting it on with different females. And so there's whoever can deliver the, the most sperm tend to fertilize the most females. So that's an example of sperm competition. But interestingly enough, in gorillas, for instance, they have very small testicles in comparison to chimpanzees, but they control their sperm competition through brute strength. And then you usually have a male that's the harem leader until they're no longer able to control it. So sperm competition is kind of a very widespread biological idea. But the idea is, again, is it's all about finding ways to that a male is trying to find a way to make sure that their paternity is insured, while a female's of course is already insured. And in some cases, insects can hold on to that sperm indefinitely and fertilize eggs when she wants to. And in some extreme cases, I don't know if it's necessarily all in insects, but females can almost select which sperm that they want after being fertilized by more than one male or having reproduction of more than one male. The ovipositor, and that's what you see here in this picture, is laying eggs. And it's obviously coming off the best abdominal segments. And so an ovipositor is unique among insects and can have many different forms. So here's an ovipositor from this um, wasp laying eggs into the cuticle of this plant. And these often can lead to galls and things that I was telling you about. Here's another example of, uh, we've seen these kind of pictures before in the previous lecture. But I believe this is a Jerusalem cricket and it's also gonna have its own, lay its eggs and has a long ovipositor back here. So again, laying eggs is what most insects do. This here is uh, called a bellostoma, which is also known as the giant water bug. And this is actually a male that has eggs on its back. So the, and this has, if you don't know what, if you can't recognize these legs, these legs in front actually grab on to predators, or excuse me, grab on to prey. And then they have this piercing sucking mouth part like a straw that can stab into their food. The food being, of course, another insect that they captured. Do you guys remember what the name of legs are that can grab onto a host? 
And this is these legs right here. Well, these are raptorial legs. Remember, we see these also in praying mantises. And you can't see it right now, but this has a beak underneath it that's very sharp. And so it can liquefy the insides of its host by biting, sticking a straw into the house and then providing digestive salivary enzymes that will eat out the insect. On its back are eggs. These are eggs that have been laid by another, the female giant water bug, because the name that's the common name for these. And then the male will actually take care of the eggs until the, these insects hatch. The eggs are so heavy that the that the giant water bug has a hard time swimming up to the surface to get air. So it literally will have to cling on to plants so it can crawl up and get enough oxygen to survive. Apparently, the, there were some people that studied um, these insects back in the early or late 1800s, early 1900s. And they were just shocked to see that a male would have to take care of the eggs in this manner, which I thought was kind of funny. And in some cases, what they would do is they would take these males with eggs on them and put them in fish tanks to study them. But the males would drown. And so they thought the males were drowning because they didn't want to put up with having to carry these eggs. But the reality is they didn't put any plant material in for them to crawl up. So I thought that was a funny observation that was made about these giant water bugs. And these can vary quite a bit from different regions. In some regions, like in Southeast Asia, giant water bugs are actually eaten. If you catch a giant water bug when you do your insect survey, be careful. They can bite you and leave a pretty nasty, painful bite because of that sharp, strong like mouth part. That's not shown in this picture, but it goes underneath their body. All right. Um, so again, this is one of my, if you want to know what one of my favorite insects are, this is one of them right here, the giant water bug. Anyway, that finishes up this lecture. We're going to take a pause and come back and discuss more things in the next lecture. Thanks for listening.